Alexa, turn the lights on, please. Okay. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. Let there be light. Let yeah. there be light. Well, maybe Alexa will take over surgery eventually. Yeah. I, I would like to get back to our conversation <laughs> because my one opportunity. Alexa, please turn the lights off. Gee, I feel important next to you, Tony. I've got this power base. No. Now, getting back no. to the serious side, yes. you mentioned children. Yep. You have eight children. So you've yes, been do. there, the wonderful, we'll talk a little bit yep. about the family soon, but mm. when you're with some of the patients, and I had the privilege of sitting through one of your presentations where these children have got the cleft palates, they've got eyes that are in the wrong area, the nose, the chin, the head, the shape of the head. Emotionally, have you ever, because you've got wonderful children, you know, healthy and happy, have you ever shed a tear privately when you've looked at these people and thought, I want to help and I'm not sure sometimes? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, it, yeah, the, the very worst of the deformities are so incredible. Um, it's interesting, occasionally we get uh, children with these deformities and some of them come in from overseas and people are raising money to bring them in and stuff. And we ask uh, the media, you know, would they help with this? Yes. And we've actually had the media say, w we just can't put this child on the front page of our newspaper. Yeah. It, it's, too confronting. it's too confronting for the public to see. And it is, it's, it's just amazing. And uh, a lot of our really, really bad cases are like that. And it is incredibly distressing. And it's incredibly distressing for the parents, especially mm. if the child's born that way. Um, and some of the mothers, uh, don't even know if they can take the child home. Well, let's talk about a couple of those. Going back to 2009, I think, the Trishna and Krishna. Oh, yes, yes. The, uh, that yeah. was worldwide news, but yeah. there was a lot happening before the media became part of the story. There was that, yes. a long time before the actual story came out and then they followed the journey through the operation and the aftermath. Yes, well... Um, Tell us about that, how, how long it was that they were actually here. Before. Well, they were, they were here for over two years. Yeah. That's... And uh, I think people didn't realise that. Um, it, it's, it, we were asked uh, whether we could help. And um, uh, I, was, I got a phone call um, from Bangladesh from... Uh, a charity worker asked if we could help and uh, I did say are the children all right oh yes they're fine but they're joined at the head and everything like that and I said well look we don't know we don't know but the only way we could find out is if we get them over and do appropriate tests and investigations mm. I had never dealt with conjoint twins at the head before and perhaps I didn't know what we were getting into. What we were getting into. That's an admission. Oh, without any doubt, it was. And uh, anyway, we got permission to bring them over. And unfortunately, when they arrived, they were not all right. They were dying. So that would have been yeah. a risk, even the flight to the get flight them to was Melbourne. A, that, the flight was a, a huge risk too, but. We didn't realise that, and I'm sure the airline that brought them out um, realises how lucky they were that nothing drastic happened on that flight. But the moment they arrived, they virtually had to go straight to intensive care because one of the children was in heart failure. And of course, if one died, both died. Both died, yeah. And um, then we had to assemble the team of neurosurgeons and anaesthetists and surgeons and work out how this could be done and whether it should be done because um, the risks of one or both dying was very high.
Mm. And of course, you, you don't just do surgery um, unless there's a, you, chance. there's a good chance and it's the right thing. And so there was quite a lot of ethical considerations to be made as well. And the whole team was brought in. I was just a small cog of the team. So you, have to get them, you have to get them to a stage of reasonable health before oh, that, you go to the next stage. That's right, and the intensive care people were fantastic and it worked out that the heart failure was being caused because one child was shunting blood into the other and so the other's heart was failing because it was being over-primed. It's, it's like force-feeding yeah. the heart which couldn't cope. So it's the two biggest statements to say, if they'd stayed at home, they would have passed away? No, there's no doubt in the world that they were within um, probably days, if not weeks at the most, from death. They were going to die, there's no doubt. Down. We'll hit the fast forward, two years of work, yep. getting them healthy, yep. two beautiful baby girls there, yep. then the decision comes, we're going to do it. Oh yes, yes, and there were a lot of hiccups along the way, but then the decision was made, we were going to separate them, uh, mm. and then the preparations were then made for that. And the major, the, the first thing that had to be done was the shunt that was causing the heart failure had to be blocked off, and that was done by uh, a, a wonderful radiologist, Peter Mitchell, by threading um, little wires and coils up through the circulation uh, and blocking it off in the brain, which was in itself remarkable. And that worked. And then our neurosurgical team, which was uh, two of them, uh, Virginia Meixner and Alison Ray, did a whole series of operations every few months to cut vessels and get s collateral circulations going in a different direction. Mm. And we had to make sure that how were we were going to close these defects? Because if you're joined by something that's the size of a saucer, mm. okay, then, and you cut it, that means you've got a defect in the baby's yeah. head, the size of a saucer on both, on both sides. So where are you going to get the new covering for the brain, the new skin, the new bone where to did fill it come those from? from? Well, there's reconstructive techniques. So the skin we came, comes from tissue expansion. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to be in the United States training when tissue expansion started uh, and saw the, the first sort of major presentation on that. And we started doing it after watching this. And then I actually brought that back to Australia in 1978. And the major use for tissue expansion then was to reconstruct uh, breasts after cancer. Mm -hmm. But basically tissue expansion is just, we see it every day in a pregnant mum. Sure, I mean, the belly comes out. Yeah, and all that skin, um, well, you hope it goes back, but as m a lot of mums will tell you, <laughs> it sometimes doesn't. <laughs> but basically, that's um, that tissue can be used. Yeah. So by putting a balloon in under the skin and b slowly blowing it up over a period of weeks, you can make a huge amount of skin, and, and then use that to close. It. And that's exactly what we did with the the uh, twin girls. How long was the operation? The final operation was a lot longer than we expected. I think it was well, nearly 32 hours in total. And the reason for that was that they'd had a few hiccups along the way and some of the vessels that had been divided in the brain had actually reconnected. Oh. And so the poor neurosurgeons were there trying to, literally to divide these vessels. Now, every time you divide a vessel in the brain, it's like a mini stroke. So if you're dividing the wrong one or in the wrong area, then you're causing damage. And this was all done under a microscope. So for every centimetre that they did, it probably took half an hour oh. under the microscope. And that, so they were nearly 20 hours in total 
dividing that, that area of brain. And there are way, the uh, so yeah. it's not a shift, it's, it's the surgeons who start or the surgeons who finish. You don't go away and... No, no, well, you, yeah, you, you've got to have... Um, a little bit of... You've got to have uh, loo breaks and yeah. coffee breaks. But you're not uh, having a sleep like break. That. No, and then once that was done, it, yes, but people teamed it a mm. bit, and then once that was done, we had our plans of then how to divide, use the skin, make uh, used artificial um, porous polyethylene mm. to make an artificial skull at that time and get them closed. And it all went very well, fortunately. It's interesting you said we, because none of it is about Tony. You, you're not oh, a no, person who no. uses I. You talk about teams, you give credit to everybody else. Oh. How many in the team? How many people would have been involved oh. in the in the let's just say the last part of the the journey, you know, the operation? Yeah, well, we had um, three craniofacial surgeons, two neurosurgeons there, assistants surgeons, and four anaesthetists. Two for each. Two anaesthetists for each child, even while they were joined together. And every time the children had to have an X-ray or an MRI, it had to be done under general anaesthetic. So that's four anaesthetists. And then you've got to get them into the machine. So that they don't fit. Yeah. The machines are made for one. One person. Yeah. So the whole hospital was involved. The orderlies, the nursing staff, everything, the intensive care, everything had to be thought out. So it was a t there was a coordinating team of nurses just looking after log the logistics of what was going on. It, every, there were planning meetings sort of once a week to make sure that everything was going right. It was, it was really a major organisation. And then the whole hospital clicked. Clicked. Yeah. And what it did for the hospital once they were separated and it worked was unbelievable. The esprit de corps yes. of the hospital. The world had, stage. Th th they just felt so good. Mm. They felt so good. And I think, um, and hospitals need that now and again. So it sort of, it worked out well for the twins. It worked out well for the hospital. And it was Two beautiful little girls yep. with the chance of leading a normal life. Yep separated the operating yeah. teams there they move back into intensive care yeah. yeah but then there's a lot more before you start doing high fives and saying hey we've done it well th that's right um if you look back because what we did was a lot of research on all the twins that had been done mm. elsewhere and things and m there was a very high death rate uh, and then also there was a very high rate of neural damage. Yeah. Okay, so the, the real aim was not just to separate them, but to not have them neurologically, worse, affected. neurologically affected. And neither of them deteriorated. So this was one of the big success stories in conjoint twin separation anywhere. And, um, and the credit to that, I think, goes to the planning and particularly the neurosurgeons. The, the, the two neurosurgeons just being so meticulous, so careful, thinking it through. And they, uh, well, I guess that's, that was the fine art. We, we sort of, the craniofacial surgeons, we was, felt a bit like the, the crude builders, you know. We put up the frame and the roof at the, and, they do. <laughs> and, and, and you know and everything like that, but they really uh, d did the microscopic stuff. Does it build a closer bond? Because obviously you respect everybody who works at the hospital. I'm not just talking about the surgeons, but yeah. when you're in a situation yeah. like that, and it's life-changing, world-making, yeah. there's there's the respect and the knowledge and the the, the I'll, say, I'll use the word friendship because you, I, you work with people to get respect, not to be friends. But absolutely, does it bring you closer together? Oh, absolutely, uh, and that's what I like about the children's hospital. Getting back to that originally, what we were talking about was I actually enjoy going to work because of the type of people that I work with, not just the patients, and. 
everybody loves going to an enjoyable workplace. And also, it's nice to know that you're doing good mm. in your work. You know what I mean? I it, know it, what you it, mean. It's, it's, it's Why are you still working good? 60 hours a week? Because you're putting in 12 hours a day, five yeah. days a week. Why are you yeah. still doing it? Uh, I, I think probably because I'm a bit mad. And uh, it's probably a habit. But I actually enjoy being busy. And I've, if you've been doing it for 50 years, which I have now, yes. then um, it's a bit hard to get out of the habit. And in fact, I'm now thinking how I'm winding down uh, and I'm finding that very confronting. It's not the easiest thing to do.